Today is September 27th. We've got Sharp Stats, a fun interview, and we're going to guess the lineup. So let's do it. Let's talk some Yanks. Hello and welcome to Talking Yanks, presented to you by Seat Geek. My name is Jimmy. His name is Jake, and we got BBD producing in the bottom corner. We had a special guest come through the office yesterday, sit down with us and chat. Very excited about that. It was a fun conversation. It's supposed to be like fifteen minutes, and we kept going, Jake, because we enjoyed talking so much. Also, I have sharp stats and guess the lineup. How you doing, Jakey boy? James Vincent from the Shore BBD. From, are you from Jersey or New York? You're from New York. And I was born in New York, but like I grew, like I'm I'm from New Jersey. Connecticut trash, Jake, checking in. I'm doing all right. Uh, Would have been nice to get that game last night, like we talked about on the last one, just to get it over with, clinch, and line up bullpen the rest of the way. But series recap coming tomorrow night after the three-gamer with Toronto ends. Otherwise, I'm doing generally well. I mean, big weekend, big stretch. Um, so still coming out of that. And then gearing up for postseason. I was talking to our our dude down at the desk this morning, and he's not a big baseball guy, but he was talking judge. He was talking postseason. So it's, it's starting to sweep the big city uh, and getting excited for that. So excited for a little midweek. Sharpie stats are, is this our second? To last sharp stats is this our last? I don't know. Guess so. I depends on what we might have some on. sprinkled in the postseason could if be, they play long enough. Could, could be could well, be regular part of... season sharp stats. So it's that's how you know it's getting real, man. That's how you know it's getting real. How's uh how's the shore, Big Daddy? It's good. They're going to Asbury Park today. It's my wife's family who are all from California, and uh, it's good. It's my favorite place in the world, obviously. So I love bringing like last year, this time we had beach week where the whole, a lot of the company came the Company's too big to house. I'm at my house now, but, uh, I love showing off this area, New Jersey, and they're really enjoying it, which is nice. Sometimes people are like, nah, yeah. pizza's better in California. Yeah. I'm like, you're lucky. The guns, a water gun and not a hot milk gun. Hot milk? Hot milk. One of the worst things to be shot with. I hate hot milk. I know you do. Yeah. yeah. Remind you of that babysitter that used to abuse you. Let's get right into the sharp stats. Who's it brought to you by? DraftKings. It doesn't come in a jar. DraftKings comes from who you are and at the DraftKings Sportsbook, the official sports betting partner of the NFL we're talking touchdowns, big plays, and even bigger wins, especially when you bet $5 on any NFL team to win. You will get $200 in free bets if they do. If that's not enough, everyone can boost their winnings with DraftKings stepped up, same game, parlays. Parsley, parley, parlay. You know, you guys ever see that movie? Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use promo code JOHNBOY to get $200 in free bets if your team wins when you place a $5 bet on any football game. That's code JOHNBOY, only at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. Minimum age and eligibility restrictions apply. See show notes for details. Details. I do want to say, Jake, you said you're getting excited for postseason. I'm very excited. I think our Boston recap episode, where it was 1 a.m. It was really late. Who are you smiling at? Joe's. Uh, 1 a.m. really late, but the juices were there. It was like exciting and, uh, and good. And then on on um the Yankees subreddit, someone posted what's your favorite talking Yanks moment, and people were posting some old moments of us. Only a handful got posted, but um 
it got my juices flowing again. Like the watch parties, the live streams, having um, you know, your feel the your feelings fully on the line, like hard on the line. I'm nervous and excited all the same. And then someone posted the one minute clip where we're just looking at Bert Smith's picture and laughing. And it it was I was and I'm in my um you know the office. No, I was in the Bronx office and you were in Denver in the kitchen. And um it's the old graphic that I made and it's just I just put Birch's face over my face and we were just giggling for a minute and it got me just kind of excited to keep that going. I just uh I respect it. I, I love it, but you can't you can't just Birch Smith. Uh can't just maybe you should start Birch Smith and us more. I don't know. I, if, Tuesday, if I still had September twenty seventh, you can't just Birch Smith. If hey, I before had, we get I, into it, Birch Smith. If I had controls, you know, if it'd I was be a still Birch doing Smith the pod, we'd be Birch. It'd be Birch Smith. It wouldn't be a Yankees night. show. I would think BBD. If you get a PNG of Birch Smith, you you should just place it over Jake's face or my face. Yeah, I mean, I can't for believe. a second or not. Whenever the podcast needs it, <laughs> I found my Birch Smith there. Okay, all right. Uh, let's get into the sharp stats. Hey guys, Queen of Stats. And this week, yeah, again, we're talking about Aaron Judge. But what I want to focus on right now is how he might be having the best closing month of any player in MLB history. I'm talking about the final month of the season, looking at all the September, October's um, regular seasons uh, in MLB history. And currently, Judge, as I take this on, uh, on Monday before the game, he's hitting 432 with a 552 OBP and a 905 slugging, good for a 1.458 OPS. Now, to put this into context, because we know the, the offensive environment is, is much different than it was uh, in different in other years, uh, there's a stat on a baseball reference called Split OPS Plus. And so it basically just compares you to everybody else in your league at that during that month in that run environment um, and you can just compare everybody throughout history. So right now, Judge has a split OPS plus of 305 in the month of September. That's 205% better than the average player. And there are only three other single months in MLB history where a player has had a higher split OPS plus. That's Ted Williams in 1942. He had a 348. Barry Bonds in 2001, September 2001, he had a 341, and Hank Greenberg in September 1940 with a 323 split OPS plus. So he is literally having the fourth best final month of a season in MLB history, all while do all while in the thick of this home run chase, and as the Yankees are trying to clinch a playoff berth and clinch the AL East. It's just incredible. And if you just look at just this season's players, so just uh, for 2022, his, the difference between him and second place is 287 points of OPS. That's the same difference between the second place guy and the 26th place guy on this list, using a minimum of 75 plate appearances. All right, guys, talk to you next week. All right, so Judge. This is a common theme of the whole season. If this is one of the last sharp stats, another doozy. Judge, obviously having a great year. But if you you want to get even crazier, smaller, his month of September, fourth best in history comparatively to the other people that are playing at the same time. Pretty insane. Special. Uh, we're we're watching a special year and while we record this uh you know i i think not a sense of panic but you know it's it's starting to get into i i think judges it's his six six straight game without a homer which by by the way the fact we're tracking something like that is ridiculous but i saw during that time frame he also his numbers are also crazy because he's walking and he's getting hits um and yeah and he had 278 batting average with a with a five hundred on base in nine hundred OPS, yeah, and in the month of September, I know Katie Sharp just ran us through it, the Queen of Stats, 
429 batting average in 22 games. 429. That's a really big month. <laughs> a 555 on base percentage. An 883 wow. slugging for a 1.438 OPS. Finishing strong is an understatement. A historic season with an all time finish. And by the way, whether. How far you want to zoom in or zoom out on Judgy this year, you're going to be okay. The numbers are going to look pretty cool. The second half, I don't know if I've seen this. Um, Because, you know, they do first and second half, not as just 81 and 81. They do it from the point of the All-Star game. So, in the first half this year, Aaron Judge, 89 games, 33 homers, 284, 364, a 983 OPS. That's really good. That's when he was on, like, still an MVP pace. Second half, 60 games, 6-0. We're talking a little over two months of baseball. 364. 506 on base, a 1.324 OPS. That's since the All-Star game. Those are not... I, I don't know if I've seen that. I've seen, I've seen a lot of stats. I've seen hot months. Uh, I've seen hot wood. That second half, I don't think I've seen that. Um, and I don't think we've seen any of this. That's the whole point. <laughs> That's why we're doing another Judge Sharp stat. People kept saying, and I heard someone when we were at the stadium say the other day, uh, and I, maybe I said this in the show already, like, is this the best walk year in the history of baseball? I was like, Yes. One of the best years in the history of baseball. Yes. There's no qualifiers. When you compare it, like the second most home runs is 40. Insane. Yeah. That I placed a bet in February saying he would lead the league in homers. Whoops. I'm so smart. Did you place that bet? At DraftKings, I placed a lot of other bets that are going to hit. But I mean, on they, that single bet. That you didn't place. So, I mean, I'm smarter. I'm smarter. Than you smarter but on other bets you might be smarter than me for sure oh thousand percent but on that one i take the cake yeah but mostly yankee stuff i've got that unlocked so um but happy for you happy for judge and uh yeah i know it's a conversation we're obviously not going to have here because there's going to be plenty of time to talk about it but you mentioned one of the best years ever uh and that whole walkier thing i i I've tried to mentally have some conversations with myself where the numbers are going to land, and I have no idea. Because we haven't seen someone hit free agency after having a season anything like this. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty wild. Out of the three players that Katie named that have had similar Septembers uh, when you compare them to the rest of the league, September. right? September. It was September. It was Ted Williams in 1942. Hank Greenberg in 1940, and Bonds in 2001. Uh, Williams did not make the World Series in 1942, so no postseason stats, so his season just ended. Bonds was in a pennant race in 2001, but did not make the loss. The Giants finished second and did not get into the postseason, but he was playing for it. But my natural inkling was, like, did they carry this into the postseason? Right. Because that's what I'd like Judge to do. Well, you How know Hammer and Hank Greenberg did. Oh, yes, he did. Oh, yes, he did. He played all seven games yeah. of the 1940 World Series, and he had a one dot OPS in that series, only walked twice. So they, since he was like, we're not scared of you, Hank, and he was like, well, smart. They won. Hammer and Hank lost. Yeah. But he hit really well. One dotted. Yeah, it's uh, it's getting really interesting, man, because, you know, Judgy, by the time this comes out, I hope he has broken the record and we've celebrated. I caught the ball. I, you know, I flipped it for proper return. And then we're still doing Talking Yanks and, and enjoying it. But even my guy at the front desk this morning, he was like, oh, I saw they were tied at twos. Last night, he was talking about Monday's Blue Jay game. And I was like, yeah, they lost, but, you know, it's it's kind of not about it anymore. <laughs> like, we're, we're getting near the postseason, man. And Judge and... Don't tell that to 
to, to the, my Twitter last night. Yeah, I mean, I I I half agreed with what you were saying, but that's 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 for the I wouldn't have I wouldn't episode. have I would have walked Vladdy, but I but we said on the episode yesterday that you're gonna see them just they got to figure out this damn bullpen. Right, right. Uh, but you can I think you could have walked Vlad. Anyways, um, but we are you know judge after having this magical season. We're going to go back to being Yankee fans, and the only thing that matters is chasing a World Series. And, like, it, he will then be judged on his postseason, which uh, I hope he continues at the rate he does. And, by the way, the fact that we say that sentence is obnoxious because nobody's continued at the rate he has except guys from the 40s or a guy whose head literally, like, tripled in size from the amount of steroids he was taking. Be cool. Because you got a small head doesn't mean you can take shots. Should I take steroids? Head, head only. Head, just for my head, just to enlarge my head a little bit. I wonder if there's something, you know, if like you're like, it's not going to improve anything else about me. I'm not going to work out more. Manfred just is like, okay, you just I'm, want a bigger head? I'm not trying to recover from anything. I just want a slightly bigger dome. I wonder, man, if anyone's ever done that. Like, people will, like, put metal in their legs to get taller. Does anyone, like, stuff their head? If I had an interview with Barry Bonds and I asked him, like, I want to make my head bigger, does that end in fists? Yes. Okay. Surgery to make head bigger. Skull reshaping, it's called. Can not, my small head be made bigger? It's not just my, like, the skull skull. It's everything. Like, I think I need more. Need more face. I too. need a bigger, like, jaw. All right. We'll get on it. Okay. We're on it. Good job. It's actually our first question that we do ask Rachel in this upcoming yes. interview. Yes. And our interview with Rachel Balkovec. Cleared that up. Is brought to you by Bear Burger. Speaking of Joe's McFly before, if you haven't seen, he went to Bear Burger. He had a couple of espresso martinis at lunch. He played that off like that's a cool thing to do uh, in our office. And it, it was because we love Bear Burger. Um, and I might do that today. Bear Burger, you can create your own favorite burger. They take burgers very seriously at Bear Burger. Uh Build your own creation and let us know John Boy sent you. Tweet it at Bear Burger for a chance to win a gift card. Also, their lunch special. Any sandwich or select sandwich served with fries, $14.95. And what Joe's was checking out, that happy hour that is the best in NYC. To say that, you better be rolling it out. And they do. $1 PBRs, $5 mules. The drink of Peter Moylan, for those that don't know. $5 teenies, oh boy. And half off bottles of wine available seven full hours, Monday through Friday, noon to seven. Boogity, boogity, boogity. I will see you at Bear Burger. Why don't you head there or order dot bearburger.com to find yourself at the best happy hour, tastiest burger joint, and overall great spot you will find. Go check it out in the description, or I, uh, I'll i see you there. Bear Burger. All right, we are joined by Rachel Balkovec. Is it ball <laughs> or bow? C. Did Hard I get it? I got all of that right, right? Ball. No. Balkovec? Yes. You said bow. Balkovitz. That's the real. We That's won't. Real. We won't reveal that. Uh, My you probably be so embarrassed. People know you best as Appalachian League Strength Coach of the Year. <laughs> Is that what you normally? <laughs> no, 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 no. That was only ten years ago. But you know, what's the most power? I mean, first full time female hitting coach or first full time female manager? Got to be manager. I guess man. It's probably manager because that's the more. It's been the more like publicized right one. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Because, I mean, we've been doing Yanks now since 2017. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking mean, about the Yankees podcast. I guess, stuff. I mean, both were were huge in Yankee land. So, I don't know. You get yeah, more Yankee, more so on the manager? I think the manager one. It's just, it's like society has changed over the 10 years I've been in baseball where it's like 
when I first got into baseball, I was the first ever female strength and conditioning coach in, in professional baseball. And I'll never forget. I mean, there was no publicity, like no one cared, like no <laughs> one, you know, which was fine and good. I'm sure. glad that happened that way. Um, but I remember I was in major league, major league spring training for the Cardinals. And, um, you know, I've been hired, no press, no nothing. And I showed up to spring training and this, this local Florida reporter like tapped me on the shoulder as I was like picking up cones, you know, from stretch, he, like tapped me on the shoulder. I was like, yes. And he was like, um, do you work for the Cardinals? And I was like, I like had all my Cardinals here on. <laughs> and I was like, yes. He's like, what do you do for them? And I was like, I'm a strength coach. And he's like, are oh, there their women? And that was the only story that ever broke about me. And it never, you know, so now then it was the hitting coach that was like, I think society was like, oh, okay. And then now the manager's just like, people are paying attention closer. Yeah. So maybe that's the most noticeable one i guess but um it's just been a change of the, like, the world more than it has been like significance i would say strength and conditioning one was more significant for me it's okay. harder i feel like hitting coach kind of hit hard because and this is like part of the problem with uh sports fans and everything is y if you've never done it you can't coach it has been the way like players or s fans have thought even though majority of hitting coaches now didn't play professional baseball um and that that was to have a, a female hitting coach is really cements like no you can teach hitting and coach and coach hitting without ever having played in the big leagues, which was something that I think even some big league players are still like you never did it you never sure because we you know you interview some and it's like how what can you tell me well I even heard someone else say that the other day about someone that's like you got these hitting coaches that are never played as a major league player on a mm -hmm. broadcast and I was sure. like dude there's so many hitting coaches because yeah. I, I read I read Jaron Diamond's it's like book about yeah uh what it's all about the hitting coach swing from, kings swing kings revolutionized hitting and all that yeah and it was fascinating because the majority of them aren't even allowed in the organization and uh it's kind of wild um that yeah that's how sports were for so long it's like everyone thinks you have to play to to teach so i thought hitting coach got on the radar really vast because it was like whoa and then manager came right afterwards and that was also cool because they condensed to four teams mm -hmm. so it was like you were with, because um, when you were hitting coach, you were with the team that got isn't around anymore, like Golf Coast our, League? Uh, it's, it's still there. Rookie League. It's basically our oh, rookie, it's league rookie League team now. Okay. Yeah. And then are you promoted and to manager for yeah. low A, right? Yep. Did you know that was coming? Were you surprised? What was the um, process of finding that out? I was a little surprised only because I just was so focused on, I just thought I was going to be a hitting coach next year, and that's what I was just focused on doing. Um, and the Yankees approached me about it and I kind of just, I was like, ah, oh, fuck. I was like, okay, <laughs> like now I'm, you know, I just gotten kind of settled in with like building relationships with the players with hitting and ev everything. And, you know, I felt like I had my feet set and now there's this whole new challenge and stuff, but they were, they just saw like the leadership, I guess, abilities in me. And, um, more than anything, the role of a manager is kind of changing, you know? So, um, I'm not sure if, if people are familiar with that, but it's, it's not so much, Rosters are mostly constructed by like computers, you know, mm -hmm. and also just um, wh who the organization wants to see play that that's becoming universal as opposed to it used to be kind of like, oh, well, where's the better matchup? And this guy's hitting this way. And yes, he's hot um, right now or he's feeling yeah, good. The manager is not doing that anymore, you know, and so those things are really not I don't want to say they're not as valuable and they're definitely still valuable in some areas of the game, especially at the major league level. But for minor league managers, you need people who can coach other things. And so they wanted somebody, you know, who could be a solid coach and also, you know, fill that role of being a leader. And so, you know, when they approached me about it, I definitely was a little bit surprised, but it actually is just the most natural next step for me. When I have a lot of questions about that process of managing in a ball, cause you have all these, I mean, I think the oldest person on the roster was like 22 years old this mm -hmm. year. Yeah. And they're just coming out of college or high school and they're high draft picks or low draft picks. Mm -hmm. And there's so much, you know, cause all the things you said about managing and it's true at the big league level, they're still, I, for sometimes making the pitching change, um, taking guy out, pulling guy in, pinch hitting, pinch running mm -hmm. at your, at single eight is cause it's really not about the winning or losing the game. It's about getting no. these guys reps. So is there a yeah. lot of that? Is it all pre-planned? Kind of, you know, a lot of pitch counts, like how yeah. we're talking a lot more about, mm -hmm this guy can only go to this pitch count and we want to, it's more important that we take him out and he stays healthy than him to pitch another inning and we win the game. And, you know, like no one, not no one cares, but it's that more a, about development. Is that a tough balance for the, the kids? 
to if they're coming from college where they're playing to win, they're competing, their coaches' yeah. jobs oh, yeah. exist only if they win yes. they, every game, and then they come here and it's like, nope, we're developing you. Yeah, we're, it's really not to say they're exhibition games, but they're they're your practice is more important than the competition of it all in a way. It's oh, gotta yeah. be hard to manage their egos or drive or competitiveness. I mean, you love it though, because yeah. there are other people in the game who've never, you know, that there's, there's two large subsects of the players that we get, which is, you know, the Latin American players and the American players who come up in a system of like, literally since I was five, I was getting trophies for winning, you yeah. know, and, and like we're winning as a team and we have a high school team and your middle school team and little league and you have all these things that you're winning and you're competing as a team. And so there's, that's kind of like inherently in the American like baseball system. Obviously then if you go on to play in college, like you just said, there's pressure. There, yeah. There's a pressure to win. Every game matters. If you lose too many games, you're out of the postseason. All those things um, are in their mind. And then you have our Latin American players who really, they get born into professional baseball, which is development, development. You know, they sign you at 16 and then, like you don't really have to win and, until like six, seven years later when you're in the big leagues. And then it's like, you really got to care. So there's an interesting dynamic of that's fascinating. I never really yeah. pictured it to be that young and not have like it be the drive for so long and then have to flip the switch and be like, yeah. and, and especially if you're playing at Yankee stadium where the fans are relentless and want you to like have that Paul O'Neill energy every single day. And yeah. Like, well, hold up. <laughs> I've been doing this for a long time. Yeah, where you that's signed with the NFL, per se, you know, like you sign out of college with the NFL, you immediately go into, I have to contribute to this team and win. Yeah. Whereas in baseball, you sign and you might not have to like, you know, people care about winning. We want to win and it's more fun when you win and we, we want individual success, which then usually le leads to more team success, of course. But at the end of the day, they know, especially some players know, they could have a horrible two months and they're still going to play every single day. And we could lose every game and then guys still get called up because they're developing individually. So it's it's just a different dynamic and it is something that we, we battle because we want them to care about the team and win. But at the end of the day, they're getting called up individually. Not yeah. They're not getting called up as a team. And they might be competing with guys that, yeah. that are they're playing with. Yeah, we, we got the first, I don't want to say the first taste of that, this year, but we, as our, as all this has grown, we now work with uh, Trevor Plouffe. We work with Jerry Blevins, Peter Moylan, and it was it was really interesting. We got together for the All Star break, and some of the minor league dynamics of kind of what we were talking about. A, there's kind of a self development part of it, and the organization invests more in certain players. Trevor Plouffe was a first round pick. Like he's his goals were not to win every baseball game. It was to get better every year so you can become our starting MLB third baseman. Uh, and the relief pitchers were kind of not giving them the side eye, but they were like, you know, we're trying to earn every meal down there to try to get your next day. Um, I mean, uh, most of that stuff, kind of like you're talking about, that's that's got to be laid out for you. But at the same time, is there is part of the managerial job dealing with the people aspect of that and making sure that everyone's, head is okay with that almost because a large part yeah a large yeah a large part of people obviously and i'm not even though those dynamics exist you don't you don't want to we don't want to promote that because we ultimately right. do want them to be able to be team players who do care about winning although every day they're looking at their individual stats or or the in individual internal stats that we have that we want them to work on Measure you know on, and so yeah. yeah those metrics um and i do think with one advantage maybe to some of the like the data age that's that's come about is that players who maybe aren't those first round draft picks but they come in and they perform and they have a high exit velocity or whatever we can go oh, okay you weren't a high draft pick but you do have this elite skill that we can see and so it kind of almost keeps them around if they can you know prove prove themselves in that way so that's been a benefit of like it's not that we only care about the top I mean we care about all of them period. right we want to see all of them develop like if they're if they're a ten great. We want to get them to 11. If they're right. one, we want to get them to two. Like we just want to develop everybody. And we really do. I think do, we really do pour into everyone. And as a coach, you don't say, Oh, well that guy's a first rounder and that guy's a 10th rounder. You don't say that. You don't feel that you just, they're this, our players that we want to see get better. So it's, you know, those damn, those dynamics exist, but I think they can be mitigated by coaches and, and staff who actually just care about the development process. Like we, we were watching the Jeter doc <clears throat> with those guys during the all-star game. And Jeter's talking about how he's a first round pick and everyone hates him and he was crying and, and all that. And I, <laughs> I asked, uh, I don't know, one of one of the relievers and I said, you know, is it is it really like 
first round pick deal with that much animosity from other players. And they played years ago because they're, they're both been retired now. But they said, yeah, I was shocked. They were like, yeah, yeah. Like first round pick is uh, they can fail a million times and they're fine. And uh, people resent them a little bit for that. And I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> I thought you were going to like say, nah, it's not that bad. We thought it was going to be like. But back in their day, fun. that's how they felt. I mean, I'm sure that is how guys, you know, and, and how I was players like, players feel like it's the yeah, how guys like some of you could work extremely hard and do everything right and show up on time and you might still play twice a week. Whereas, you know, a first round draft pick could possibly, I'm not saying this happens all the time, but could possibly, you know, show up late three times and not work hard and he's still going to play every day. Like those yeah. dynamics do exist to a certain extent. I'm sure that is frustrating. I do think it's interesting how you talked about like exit velo and the underlying metrics now that. I would have to guess way back, you know, results were told the whole story where a guy can maybe be struggling, but you can say, wait, but you have this elite skill that we're seeing in the metrics and that mm-hmm. might save some guys careers or prolong them a little bit. Cause it's like, how do we harness or twist that where the guy might've been just dinking and dunking hits nonstop yeah. and got yeah. promoted. And then it just doesn't translate where you're like, ah, oh. it's interesting how all of that has changed the way we like look at development and look at skill. With uh, squaring yeah. balls up, or you can hit this pitch, we can't hit that pitch. Like Jake and I were talking about, they don't talk about prospects, what pitches they hit. You know, if a guy is raking in double A, but he all of his hits come off fastballs, that's something the organization probably knows mm-hmm. and goes into calling him up or not calling him up. That us, us yeah. as fans, that's not public right now. Like, I can't go look at Florio and be like, well, yeah, he's hitting 280 in the last month, but they're all on fastballs and he's facing all these pitchers that are just working on their fastballs. Like all yeah. that stuff. <laughs> we have no idea that the organization yeah. probably does. And, uh, it's fascinates me what actually goes into all the decision making. Yeah. There's a lot, a lot that goes into it that people probably don't see. And, and just like you just said, you, you know, we might, we might know something behind the scenes where it's like, we know this player still needs to work on this and still develop. And, you know, to the naked eye, it's like, Oh, he's hitting two ninety in double a, why wouldn't he be in the big leagues or something, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, so there's just a lot more information. It, it's not everything, you know, and there's still some of the non metric, you know, perspective that really does help, but it just gives you, and, and I think especially younger players could and should appreciate the fact that at least organizations are looking at them objectively yeah, and not just, I mean, some guys, Hey, I don't like that guy. And then all of a sudden he gets stuck in low A and he's doing well. And like that, that actually did happen prior to us having objective information to use to evaluate people. So even if we, yeah. you know, even if we, even if we all hate a player and it's like, well, it's right there in the data that he is valuable to our organization and our team. I mean, nobody can really argue with that in the room. And you mentioned players you hate. Who are your most hated players? <laughs> <laughs> Let's just empty it out. Well, let me no. grab my list. No. I was looking at the roster and not that you hate this guy, but there was a guy that had a fun name. Just an easy I, segue. Who is was, it? Uh, he went to Penn State, Bailey Dietz or something oh, like that. Oh, Bailey Dietz. This is a fun well, name. Bailey Dietz. Is that what it is? Dees. Dees. Wait, so many jokes. So oh, little time. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, yeah. I don't know the jokes, but I Deez, might yeah. be able yeah. to figure it out. Yeah, Dees. Yeah. 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 What's um, what's a highlight from this year? You're you're managing the team. You go first win. It could be some promoting I don't know, someone. Some I mean, kids yelling cool. at you after the game at how much they love you. Like what if you're um, you're sitting in this chair? You're in the number one up and coming sports media company in the world. You're bad. Yeah. I guess l- reflecting right now, like if you jump to somewhere, where does your brain brain jump is a, a happy memory from this year. Easily. There's like two kind of, I have like two jobs, you know, like I, I'm a manager for the Yankees baseball, blah, blah, blah. And then I also like have this, I feel like I have this responsibility to society or women or, you know, like there's this whole other part. And so two things are uh, the obvious one is, sending up Grant Richardson and Jason Dominguez together, which that video came out, which yeah. was awesome. I don't know if anyone listening or watching saw that, but they're like best of friends, best buddies. Grant really helped Jason develop in some ways this year. And um, it was cool. Like we got to play Jason and tell him he wasn't going to Hudson Valley. And then he actually told Grant he was going and then they went together. It was great. It was a great moment. I just seeing those guys develop um, and then get the opportunity together was really cool. Um, and just in general, seeing guys mature, period, like the yeah. overall, it's the whole point of player development. It's why I fell in love with the idea of working in professional baseball is the minor league system and seeing guys really go through like crazy development is really what I'm passionate about. Mm-hmm. And so that's what always comes to mind is like those players that got better and, and not just on the field, but maturing and yeah. becoming young managing men. Managing 20, 21 year old. 
Yeah. Kids. Yeah. I was so I dumb. was so dumb at oh 2021. Oh my god. Really? Were you? Oh my god. Because I, I, our players I, I, are I just put, the most mature. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I put 24. Yeah. Responsible yeah. young men. I don't know what you're talking about. 24 to 25 <laughs> is when I honestly think like I, I yeah. started actually thinking like an adult and was like, oh, I got to pay bills and I got to like, shower and clean my <laughs> yeah. room a little and maybe yeah. I should dress nicer. Yeah. But 20 and 21 and 22, yeah. Just, yeah. Just, just dumb. Yeah. They're like angels. Subhuman. Yeah. Yep. That's my job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, I, I don't know what's overstepping our boundaries. Hmm. Like what's next? Like, you know, um, there's a lot of firsts on here. And it's fucking I mean, incredible. Like I, I don't know. I don't. I don't know if you want to do pie in the sky or if you want to check boxes or if we can't discuss this at all. Uh, I mean, I think like for sure or not for sure. I really don't know for sure. But uh, managing is on my mind for the next couple of years or whatever. Fill in okay. the blank. Um, but in the future, would be I want to be a general manager. That's for sure in my mind. Um, that could be you know, I don't know. That could be seven years, ten years. 20 years. I don't know. Right. I mean, I, I really said that I would, you know, after being a hitting coach, I would go in the front office and now here I am. So I don't know. Right. Um, I'm open to a lot of different things, but I do think just being in that, you know, people say, Oh, do you want to be a major league manager? But ultimately like the major league manager is still not calling all of the shots. And also from a global perspective in an organization, the GM is doing that. Yeah. So that's what I really want to do. You know, and it's not to take it away from any major league manager. They're serving a wildly important role of leadership. Um, but they're still, at the end of the day, being handed the players that they get. Yeah. And, you know, and so I want to be involved in the entire process, top to bottom with an organization. And that's uh, in the general manager role. Um, but I'm not worried about, I mean, that's 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 pie in the sky. When that I mean, as a, yeah. a lot of baseball fans, when they, when, when you talk, when you're a fan, you play GM. You don't really play manager. Yeah. Right. These days now, like you play like I want this guy in the roster. Yeah. I think this should be the rotation or this. And that's used to be maybe the manager's decision, but that's GM. So as fans, our natural, the way we talk about it and, and to pick apart the decisions, we're yeah. playing GM, GM these days. Yeah. So I mean, that managers, is the old, get, that's, managers still get fired as if, and they, again, they do have a huge impact. But at the end of the day, they're playing the players that they've got. You well, know, and keeping is, the room focused and organized and, and not at odds with the stats that are making the decisions or the stats that aren't making the decisions is still a very important role. Because yeah, it's huge. Um, it's just not, you know, it's just not the role that I necessarily want. But I'm also, I never would have said that I wanted to be a manager necessarily. And it really was the natural next step. And so I'm really open to a lot of different things. As you m move on, you talk about the role of um, being a uh I forget the word you said, but being a um, representative of, of females in sports and getting new things. And like Jake said, the first, this first, this is that ever get tiring in a way? Like when you get a new job, you don't want to have to do the whole, the first, the first and the headlines and all this. And you're like, no, I just let me just do the yeah. job or yeah. But, yeah. but on the other side, <laughs> yes. yeah. Yes. But on the other side, like you read the article on um, when you were at, I think it was Lakeland Joker merchant and, and you manage mm -hmm. the first game and, and the article said there was a group of um, girls cheering the yeah. game and stuff. It's got to be really cool. Like I got moved by that because representation still matters so much. You talk about we've talked before uh, we started recording about Jenny Finch and seeing her. Like oh yeah, no, you're I that mean, for those girls now. So it's still got to be. Do I get tired? Yes. Does it matter? No. Yeah. It's like it's my job. Like I didn't. You know, you don't sign up for this type of role and then say, "Oh, I, I don't want to do any media." You know, like I just don't believe that that's what the way to handle it. I think it's your responsibility, and um, it is my responsibility to be a role model. And I can't be perfect and do every interview and all of that stuff. But I do try to do as much as I can because it's my job. Like I don't know how you can accept a role like this and not want to. I don't know. Participate in yeah. the in the in society like you Makes know sense. and i want the responsibility yeah. too you know i do think that i enjoy that part of it to some extent and there's definitely some times where it's time consuming and tiring and i'm repeating the same story yeah. for the 10 millionth time which one's like that? you know <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. um yeah but it's it's just like i said i don't i really just don't view it as me having an option it's just i shouldn't have signed up for it if i didn't want to Take the good and the bad, the yeah. heat, the comments, the trolls, the people that are talking shit, blah, blah, blah. Like, I shouldn't have signed up for the job then. Yeah, it makes sense. Did you get ejected? Can you get ejected? Do I got ejected. You did? Yeah, I did. Did you want to get ejected? 
Uh, you know what? No, it's like not really, really? my favorite part. I don't, it's not okay. really, I'm a really, really big on personal responsibility. And so it's definitely a, unexpected. Like I'm a, I'm a feisty person. I could get really heated really quickly. Mm. But interestingly, like I was raised and also by just coaches throughout my career of just like, hey, the umpire makes a bad call, like too bad, figure it yeah. out, get better. If, if that's the one call that ruins the game, like we, we didn't win, you know? Right. A lot like, of people weren't raised that way and it blows my mind. A lot of yeah, people in our like, comment section are on Twitter. And I'm like, what? You can't like actually blame them. Like the, yeah, like but some fans really do. I'm like, but yeah. I mean, there can be some critical calls and there's some really, really b- bad calls, but especially like, as you mentioned, you said it, I didn't sometimes, you know, young men at age 21 aren't the most mature yeah, human yeah. beings. And it's like, you know what? Like you're complaining, but you just, took three fastballs down the dick and then you're complaining about the ball on the, on the corner. It's like, I don't, you know, I can't help you. Did you like, say magic words when you got ejected or was the it like magical? One? Yeah. Magical words. Yeah. You, that's, the, that's <laughs> the actual one that they don't tell you. you. About. Yep. You Yeah. we got to yeah. do all the lip reading and breakdowns. As soon as they say you boom, you're out. Yeah. Don't personalize the call. Yes. And, I uh, might've said, yeah, you guys. Hmm. Yeah, we'll find so. it. We got the MLB. Yeah. No, we got the it's, it's you know, it minor league film is really I'll, that great. I'll, so. I'll go read your lips. We'll get as many views <laughs> as possible. It, it was really quick. I just, yeah, yeah and well, it got straight to the point. So, so you didn't bad. know, you didn't go yelling thinking like, I'm going to get ejected over this one. Mm, I did. Okay. Yeah. I kind of had planned it a little okay. bit. Just felt like the right time. Were you protecting uh, Dominguez or someone? Uh, like Not a, Dominguez. But it just, yeah, it was just, when I had been in a kind of a tough week with that crew and I just felt like I had to, Say something, but um, but yeah, I mean, it was really lackluster. And then they, the guys were like, "You need to yell more." I was like, "I don't, God, one thing at a time." So was it like when the uh, veterans came and played? I, I think you had Severino come, Britain mm-hmm. come, come through and be part of the the team in <laughs> the atmosphere. Yeah, and for them, um, you weren't around when they came up, like Severino and them, and then it's all new. Is it? Is it anything? Is it just they're there and they leave? Do they? Do they do a big rah rah speech or anything? No, or? no, they don't. I mean, they don't. But it it's so impactful to have those guys come through because they have their routines. They're prof- they're professional. They're high level professional. And then you know our young twenty to twenty two year old players see that, and it's like I do. I don't know if it sinks in. Some of them might be like, oh, "Look at that guy. I'm like that guy. I can play right now." But some of them probably see them and go, "Oh wow, that guy's dialed in. He's here early. He's doing his routine. He's like, I mean, yeah. he's really like they see." the process of somebody who does need to go contribute and win. Um, and I know that's really impactful for them. So we love having them. I, uh, I'm kind of over baseball. Okay. Oh, um, okay. I'm softball. It is. I'm enjoying you. Give oh. us who you are. <laughs> I'm enjoying like, you. you know, you obviously, like you said, you're carrying a big torch. It's badass. Yeah. You've got a fun personality. You got a couple oh, sisters in the city. What do we have? Like, what else are we into? Guilty pleasures. I don't, what, like, who are you? I'm really fucking weird. So you're, yeah. You're okay. I mean, you're, you're in the safe space. All right. So, I mean, look at I these mean, frogs on the desk. Yeah. Like, I know th- that's weird. One of them's looking down somebody's underwear. <laughs> like, what yeah. is happening? They're toddlers. This is okay. <laughs> we think, so. uh, yeah. Who am I? I mean, I'm yeah. like, oh, I'm a minimalist. I'm a nomad. Okay. I travel over the world. I own very few things. Um, I mean, my, my journey has been so fucking weird. It's, yeah. it's indescribable. Um, I think that <sighs> what got me to this question was oh. like, I was trying to, I was trying to connect like your Netherlands time, your yeah. Corpus Christi time, all right, let's, like let's to try to in. put all that in Australia, the past. People, Australia do not, Australia. people do not know what happened. Like, I think, <laughs> I think that interestingly, when the news broke about me being a hitting coach, it was it was one of the first. So Rachel Folden and I for the Cubs, Rachel Folden from the Cubs, we got hired almost at the same time. But that was we were the first coaches to ever wear a uniform and be on the field full time right. for an organization. And it's weird because my family and my friends knew what I had done, crawled and fucking scraped my way and just threw brick walls to get there. And the comment section was like totally against it and i was like damn you know and they're like <laughs> oh the, these aren't qualified blah 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 and yeah. i was like you have not a fucking idea like the yeah. amount of shit that i've done is i can't even sometimes i look back and i'm like how did i do that like i don't yeah. even know 
So yeah, Corpus Christi to Amsterdam to, yeah, we'll, we'll just zoom in on that part. <laughs> yeah. So I had been a strength coach for six years in professional baseball and I was just, I'm a generalist, you know, so I got in to baseball through strength and conditioning, which if you think about it, is kind of how I actually had to do it because even then there were no women being strength coaches, but you know, you're still a strength coach. You're not coaching hitting, mm -hmm. God forbid. Right. So, you know, I'm a strength coach, like, you know, women can lift weights. That's fine. And so I got in that way. And then I was a strength coach for six years, lived in the Dominican Republic, you know, two different organizations. Um, and then I was, I was always popping into like hitting meetings, pitching meetings, scouting, like front office stuff. I was always like wanting to be a part of everything in my mind at the time to be better at my job and, and understand the big picture and understand pitching mechanics and hitting and all these things. And <clears throat> so I, through that process quickly realized that strength and conditioning, I was going to hit a ceiling at some point. And I mean, I want to be a GM, so right. you can't from the strength and conditioning position, you can't then jump to general manager. You have to fill that gap somehow. So I kind of knew I wanted to get out of strength and conditioning. And I had a mentor whose name is Dylan Lawson, who some people listening to this podcast yeah. might know is our major league hitting coach right now. He was a minor league, hitting, minor league hitting coach for the Astros. And I knew I was get, getting out of strength and conditioning. I knew I wanted to go back to school. And he actually suggested to me like getting into um, eye tracking, which is the research I did at driveline, which I'll get to. But basically the leading researcher for, in the entire world in eye tracking is in Amsterdam. So naturally going back to school, I said, why not move to Europe? Yeah. So I sold all of my possessions and like hmm. uh, backing up. I was in, when I decided to do that, I was in uh, double A for the Astros as a strength coach in Corpus Christi. And if anyone knows that league, which you probably don't, but the Texas league is the worst minor league league for travel. So we were like doing 12 hour overnight bus trips mm. and then wake up and all that season I was studying for prerequisites for my biomechanics neuroscience master's degree. So on top of that, I'm a woman. I don't know if you noticed, but I'm a woman. And so I was like sitting outside of clubhouses, studying physics on cement floors outside <laughs> of the clubhouse. So much so that one time we were in San Antonio, which is kind of an older uh, stadium, and there was no room for me in the clubhouse whatsoever. So I was like sitting outside, like swatting away mosquitoes, like studying physics. And I finally just went and sat in the women's restroom. Never forget this one. I was literally sitting in the handicap stall in the women's restroom in that stadium, like studying my physics cards next to a toilet. And I was like, I'm not sure how much worse this could get. <laughs> so... That was that year, 2018, um, my, taking my prerequisites just to get into the program. Then I sold all of my possessions, literally car, everything. I moved to Europe with three suitcases, um, studied in a program under the leading researcher in the world for um, eye tracking, basically. And um, he does like cricket and baseball. So I kind of did my coursework over there and then designed my research projects. And then I went moved to Seattle um, and did my research and eye tracking at Driveline. And this whole time, Dylan... Lawson had kind of been like a mentor of mine. Like he was a friend and a mentor while I was with the Astros and then kind of mentored me and like guided me through that process. Um, and then hired me as a hitting coach in 2019. So that's a long story short. That doesn't even, I mean, getting into baseball is a whole nother process, but all that to say, it's like when people are like, Oh, these came out of nowhere. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and like Dylan, she, you know, she snuck up on us. Yeah, like it, you know, and so I think the and the way it was portrayed in the media too was kind of like it kind of got portrayed like that. But I had already been in baseball for six years and lived in the Dominican Republic, learned Spanish, became bilingual, done all these things, went back to school, all of the process. I mean, it was it was a really treacherous journey just to get to be hired as a rookie league, you know, hitting, <laughs> league coach. hitting coach. And Dylan was my my mentor and my teacher for all of that. And so, you know, that was, that was a very treacherous process just to get to that point. So yeah. Oh. Was, yeah. Good times. Favorite place you lived. <sighs> Sydney. Yeah. Sydney. Yeah. I was doing, yeah. So I show up to spring training and then they're like, psych. Yeah. No spring training, no baseball. Yeah. You're out of here. See you later. Uh, mm -hmm. But honestly, that was kind of a respite for me. I, like, I mean, I don't mean to, COVID, I don't want me to take COVID lightly. Right. I mean, I actually lost, like, my high school coach died of COVID during that time. Um, but I had just been such a through such a grueling process of, like, getting to Amsterdam, living in Amsterdam all by myself, riding a bike around for a year in the rain. I had <laughs> I was so broke. I mean, by the time the Yankees hired me, I had maxed out a credit card and had, like, $2 in my bank account and just had given up everything in my whole life to do it. And so when COVID hit, it was, like, kind of a – 
like, all right, I could actually reflect on what had happened in the last 18 months um, and kind of reset myself and actually ended up moving to Australia. Of course, Manny Ramirez was on our team. It's just like a, sure. this weird, he's so awesome. <laughs> so got to hang out with Manny Ramirez every single day for three months and just, you know, learn from him and get his perspective on things. So that was incredible. Um, so yeah, Sydney was an awesome city awesome. and it was during COVID. So there was nobody there. Very mm. like Ooh. literal once in a lifetime experience. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. I lived in Australia for two years when I was little. Mm-hmm. I got to go back, but I haven't been back since I was. What was 10. your team? You the North Sydney Bears. The North Sydney Bears. They're still so. there. Yeah. Oh my gosh. The mm-hmm. North Sydney Bears. Yeah. Who knew? Yeah. Probably yeah. saw them while you were out there. Uh, I was yeah, eight, probably. played on the 10 year old team because, I mean, uh, you know, I was American. Wow. <laughs> I think they have a statue of you there. Automatically actually. bumped up. Well, wow. uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, not bad. Yeah. All right. I think, uh, yeah, we yeah, we're getting told. We said 10 minutes or told. so, and yeah, we got rolling. Chatting. But, oh, my gosh. We'll have really? to do a part two, you know. Okay. Yeah. Just all, it's all Sydney talk, Australia talk. Yeah. But, yeah, well, thank you very much for joining us. Oh, I, we, I could guys. chat forever. I love minor league baseball and kind of structure of baseball, and your story is awesome. So we'll have you back on later. I appreciate it. For yeah. a young woman who was playing softball at that time, and, like, you know, I was, like, getting into high school, so it was prime time of me understanding, like, my opportunities in sport. And so that time when softball started to like first get on television for college, I was able to like watch Nebraska softball and kind of follow the teams and the players. And yeah, yeah. so I was like, I was actually followed softball. Like oh, baseball cool. was just, baseball is, uh, um, I think a lot of people do get into baseball because they're like, I'm, I love baseball. I'm a fan. And I got into baseball because I actually am enamored with like the business of professional baseball in the minor league system. Yeah. So I'm not like a super fan. I'm just, I just like my job, you know. Well, that's good. It well, works yeah. all the same. Yeah, works out. And was that, I don't want to say a golden age for softball, but it, that's also my sports prime. I was like an ESPN junkie. So like Kat Osterman, like I remember University of Texas, like she was, and like Jenny Finch, obviously, like. Finch was later, I guess, was, she it was, was like that, early. Was that was a like moment mid-aughts. for softball, like that era a little yes, bit? Yeah. I think it was yeah. like 95 to 2005. Jenny Finch. Of all things, which I don't judge her at all for this, but Jenny Finch was, like, in Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Issue. Right. And I think then, like, I remember that. And I was, you know, I, even as a young girl, I was, like, empowered by that. I was like, oh, damn, like, a softball player right. is in this. You know, she's kind of this, like, becoming famous, if you will. Yeah, famous enough to transcend, yeah, like, the sport. The sport. Yeah. Um, it's always hard. It's hard to do. Even for baseball players these days, yeah. it's hard to do. Yeah, so that was I'm important. a household name. Like, Jenny Finch yeah. is a household name. Yeah, yeah. And it's softball. We have not that many baseball players right now that are household names. Yeah. Where if I could ask my sisters or my aunt that have no interest in sports, they probably know who Jenny Finch is, but yeah. probably not, you know, Giancarlo Stanton, if I asked my one aunt. Yeah, exactly. It's really tough to do, and she did it. It's crazy. Yeah, so that was, I think, kind of a high point, I guess. Yeah. For- are we good, babes? Yeah, Be I've been rolling. doing this at, at you oh. a little bit, oh, but rolling? it's a good conversation. I didn't want to interrupt you. Yeah. I've, I've been rolling. All right, cool. <laughs> yeah, just put it at the end. There you have it. Fantastic sit down with manager Balkebeck. Awesome. I kind of didn't know what we were going to into uh, with Rachel. Like, we've obviously heard the story, uh, but she came in and she had the John Boy Media energy. She was like, I'm, I'm here to have fun. She, she stopped at MLB offices beforehand, and it was a lot of, you know, serious conversations and firm handshakes and all that. So she was excited to... To John she Boy said, Media. Ask, she said, ask me anything. Don't take it easy. And Jake was like, I, or, uh, I don't do hard-hitting questions. Yeah, I said I'm not a Tom Brokaw, which is, does that reference hit? Do you know who that is, BBD? She gave you a pity I've laugh. I've heard the name. Okay. I got to stop with the Tom Brokaw jokes. I guess so, yeah. Uh, and that was brought to you by Bear Burger. It was also brought to you by Cuts, which is bringing you Guess the Lineup. Oh, who's in it? Who's starting? Who's getting cut with cuts? Cuts! Clothing. They are numero uno in baseball fashion. That's not on here, but I made it up because they reference guys like Bryce Harper. He's wearing cuts. Walker Buehler. He's wearing cuts. And maybe you know Mariano Rivera, the best cutter of all time. Cuts, they have shirts, tees, polos for any 
occasion. It is comfortable. How about that long sleeve Henley? Uh Uh-huh. No problem. Short sleeve crew neck. They've got it. Engineered to last and won't fall apart. These aren't fast fashion shirts. These are cuts. Join thousands of men who have already made the simple decision to elevate their wardrobe with cuts and get 15% off your first order by going to cutsclothing.com slash yanks. That's cutsclothing.com slash yanks for 15%. Oof. Jim, you got that lineup? Well, they've been running uh, a... Give me that uh, lineup. They've been running a lineup. Very similar lineup for a while now, right? It's kind of cool. So they've gone... um, Judge, Rizzo, Glaber, Donaldson. I mean, the last one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 games, Glaber has batted three. Judge has let off, and 13 out of the 14, Donaldson has batted fourth. Stanton was two. They switched him to Rizzo recently, and now Stanton... Um, has been five ever since he came back, really, unless he sits. So Judge, Rizzo, Glaber, Donaldson, Stan has been the one through five with uh, with uh, Ozzy, with Oswaldo Cabrera as the six. All right, and then Bader, seven, Kiner, eight, catcher, nine. That's, that's what they've been doing. I think by the time playoffs comes, I think they want – Stanton back to three. They want like they hope he can get back to three, right. and that moves. I don't know if you keep Glaber four. Then I don't, or maybe you keep Glaber three and you put Stanton four and Donaldson five. I don't know, but this is what what they've been doing. They have Barrios is on the bump. Is there a lefty they would want to get action against him, and a guy that they would sit? Um, Judge is going to be out there in right field. Back-to-back center field days for Bader. Has he done that yet? Yeah, he did three in a row at one point. Um, I think we're going to run that back. I don't know. I mean, do, they're not going to sneak Tilo in a start, I don't think. They could catch Higgy over Trevino, but I think they'll run tomorrow a day game. Uh, I don't think so. I don't so, believe right? so. Night game. So then they have options catcher-wise. It's whoever they want. And that's it. And I don't think they're going to take IKF out because they don't like making moves like that after bad outings. Right. They don't want to make that part of the storyline, which is is a little ridiculous in a way from the uh, the concept of team sports, but it is what it is. Yeah, I, I guess. Hicks. Hicks is the only one. Do they do they put Hicks in this lineup? Uh, where do you put him? You'd replace him. You'd you'd sit uh, Cabrera. I uh, I mean that that would seem silly to me. Uh, if I were, I agree, but that's I, I mean that's, they do. I think they've only done that on Bader rest days. Like I don't think they've sat Cabrera for Hicks. Um. Yeah, I don't. I don't think so either. Because Cabrera was playing right field back when that happened. Like if, unless it was a judge, I, I guess it would day. be like if if Hicks has good numbers off Barrios, which I don't know, then they could give Bader another rest day. But I uh, I don't I don't think they've done Hicks for as well though. They haven't. I'm looking now. They haven't. But 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 that I, I don't think they're going to do it either. I think they're going to run it back. That's the only my my point was the catchers are the catchers. Um, I don't think they're going to start Peraza because they're not going to do that after IKF has a rough outing. I, they're not going to start Tilo because that's not the formula. And then it would be Marwin, and I also don't think they're going to start Marwin today. They want to beat the Blue Jays, and they want to win these games. They're going to do funky stuff with the bullpen to make sure those guys are ready. But I think the offensively, it's find a rhythm. I think their like, plan for these two games would be like the lineup they've been doing tonight, win the game, which clinches the division. Their seating's pretty locked in once the division's clinched. Party tonight. Give guys double rest tomorrow and play all the bench guys tomorrow, off day, Thursday. I think that would be their plan for the weekend, for the for this series. Yeah, I agree. I mean, Hicks' last uh, 
19 plate appearances. His numbers are insane. So I just don't know if in their head, keeping Hicks regular right. and like at starting him once every four games is part of the plan. Or do they really think Carpenter and Benny are going to come back and Hicks is off the roster so they don't even care at all about that? Yeah, I mean, the the only thing where I think Hicks slots would be against lefties. Um, and with Barrios tonight, I, I don't see that. So, yeah, I, I would love the party theory if we could execute on that. Um, but, yeah, otherwise they're rolling this, this lineup. Uh, would it be... Okay to see Peraza out there, sure, but I can't believe in that. Do you think they'd roll it like the exact same? I don't know how many times they've done. I think it's only uh, I mean, twice between, in a row. Between catchers and scooching guys, not really, no. It's been, a sen- it's been as close to that as it can be of late. Besides yeah, the yeah catchers, but, but if but Trevino yeah. starts today, then we're guessing that they're going to do like the exact same thing back to back, which they've done before. But I don't know if they've ever done one three times. But yeah, I don't I don't see them trying to sneak Hicks, Marwin, Tilo into this game or Peraza. So I think it's the lineup. Yeah, interested to see. Barrios has been worse against lefties. We'll see. But well, that's the problem. Cabrera's a lefty. Right. I I, be, I, uh, I still, I have Bader more in risk of not playing than as well, though. I think they'll do Bader two days in a row center field, and then tomorrow it would be, you know, like BBD said, party. It's it's uh, Hicks. Uh, <laughs> Hicks, Marwin, as well, though, tomorrow. Tilo. If they win tonight. Or yeah, uh, Hicks, Tilo. Marwin, Tilo, if they win tonight. I guess there's a chance of like, eh, Bader but then you're coming not resting like Rizzo stuff. and stuff. I, 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 I don't know. There could be some Bader coming back from foot stuff, get him a day off the turf, but I think the plan would be win today and, to, and they do that with him tomorrow. My official guess is they run back the same lineup. If it's Higgy for Trevi, that doesn't count as doesn't us count. being wrong. We got it last time we did it, so we're on a heater. Been good. Wrap it and go watch baseball today. Uh, and also tweet out some love at Rachel Balkovec. She was the best. Um, uh, and baseball today is also the best. Uh, go check it out on Amazon AMP app. Code baseball today. Uh, Trevor Plouffe, Chris Rose. Um, they're studs. I, I love both those men. And they're pretty good about talking about baseball. So go check them out. Goodbye. Go Yanks. Tell them, Grams. Go Yankees.